Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at the Belko Experiment, since it won the YouTube poll I posted a few weeks ago. The Belko Experiment was written by James Gunn in 2007, but by time production began in 2015, he was a bit too busy with the MCU to direct it himself, so Wolf Creek director Greg McLean took over. And to me, the resulting rift in tone kinda hurts the final product. Gunn's script is full of dark humor, but McLean's direction takes the material a tad too seriously, and we wind up with an uneven movie that gives me tonal whip Flash. Belko has gleefully been described as Office Space meets Battle Royale. A fair enough description, since hey, it's got John C. McGinley in it, and he was one of the bobs in Office Space. The premise is simple. At an office building in Columbia, 80 American employees are told that they have to start killing each other, and that's pretty much it. The Belko experiment, like Battle Royale, has the most horrifying concept in the world to me. Average everyday people being forced to murder or be murdered. Y'all know me, I want you to be good people. Well, what are good people supposed to do in a situation like this? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins in the capital of Colombia, where a single imposing building stands representing American capitalism in the form of Belco Industries. Looks like today has some extra security going on, as COO Barry Norris, played by Tony Goldwyn, notes the guards are new faces, and these new faces are checking every nook and cranny on the vehicles driven in by the American workforce. Also, the local employees are being sent back home. Alright, three day weekend! The opening credits play over a montage of future victims and close ups on office supplies that will sadly never get to see used as weapons. Also, there's a big rack of monitors and a switchboard somewhere. Those are important. This movie's got a real big cast, and you're about to see them all murder each other, so let's get to know a few faces before all the killing starts. New hire Danny, played by Melanie Diaz, is meeting with Vince, the head of HR, on her very first day. She mentions that she got the standard company tracer put in her head the day before, an electronic tag meant to protect her and all the other employees from kidnappings. A likely story. Danny meets some friendly faces, like Vince's assistant Razia, as well as Roberto and Leota, two other employees who befriend her right away. Fun crowd, but I'd rather hang out over here, with Peggy, played by Rusty Schwimmer, who was the abrasive diner owner in Jason Goes to Hell, and Keith, played by Josh Brenner, he of the big head and small ambitions. Leandra, played by Adria Arjona, is getting leered at by Wendell, played by everyone's favorite snarky doctor, John C. McGinley. She tries to tell him off using the office's weirdly backwards messaging system, but she has to resort to just closing the blinds on him to get real privacy. You know, the kind of privacy that'll let her make out with her boyfriend, Mike Milch, played by John Gallagher Jr. All of these characters, and plenty others, get their day interrupted by a voice coming over the intercom. There are currently 80 of you in the building. In eight hours, most of you will be dead. Your chance of survival increases by following my orders. Your first task is simply this. Murder any two of your fellow employees within the next half hour. Yep, that's it. They say it doesn't matter how, but if two people aren't dead in 30 minutes, there will be problems. The employees aren't sure how to react to it, whether it's a joke or whether they should be concerned or what. But the phone lines are dead, cell reception is non-existent, and it, uh, it looks like they ain't getting out of there anytime soon, because that building is quickly becoming a bunker, which is more than a little concerning. With most employees gathered in the lobby, Barry takes control and tells everyone to remain calm because it's probably just some kind of prank, bro. He ends the powwow with some excellent corporate buzzwords. I'm gonna go work on that and I'll circle back to you as soon as I can. That guy knows how to business. Mike asks head of maintenance, Bud, played by Michael Rooker, if he can do anything about those walls, but when he takes a blowtorch to him with Lonnie, the Robin to his Batman, they discover ain't nothing getting through that metal. They're shut in tight. Plus, the air conditioning's been turned off. All of that, combined with those scary new guards, has Mike concerned that Barry's wrong about it being just a prank, bro. So what are you saying? We should pick out a couple folks to kill? No, 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 not at all. It's a joke, Mike. Barry tells Mike that he's probably just wigging out a little bit and that things will be okay. Keith, Danny, Leota, and Roberto go up to the roof roof and try to flag down one of those new guards that they see. But this is none of his business, so he completely ignores them. There's another group on the roof getting high, but not too high. It's from Panama, man. It's not that strong. <laughs> It isn't. I know. It includes Marty, played by James Gunn's little brother Sean, and Chet, who I would just love to have give me a big ol' bear hug. Marty tells the others that this whole thing is just a psychological test, man, and that they just want to see how the employees react to all this. Look at me. Look how fucking chill I am. They lose, man. But then the chick next to him's head blows up. Oh yeah, that's not just a prank, bro, or a psych test. This shit's for real. And the heads keep pop popping down in the sweltering lobby, with another three employees getting their heads blown up by mysterious means that people at first assume is gunfire, but then realize like his head exploded from the inside. That's right. The explosions are coming from inside the head. Yep, it's those tags that everyone had installed in the back of their heads when they began working there. So uh, that sucks. Mike gets thinking fast. He grabs a box cutter and heads into the bathroom, where he starts slicing into his own head to get rid of the baby brain bomb. Unfortunately for him, the voice hears all, sees all. Michael Melch, set down the knife immediately or we will detonate the explosive. They give him a countdown and he stops before it ends, saving his head. Later on, Vince and this guy Terry discover that there are indeed cameras everywhere. As Mike gets stitched up, Wendell increases his creep factor, telling Leandra how he clocks all the quote-unquote flirtatious looks and emails she sends his way. 
Fuck off. Yeah, fuck off, Wendell. Back in the lobby, Barry strikes up a convo with security guard Evan, played by James Earl, and asks him for the keys to the armory so he can make sure the guns in there stay safe. Wait, what? I'm sorry, this building has an armory? That sucks. When Evan refuses, Barry tries to pull rank, but Evan nominally quits his job in response. He'll just hold on to those keys for now. Thanks, Barry. Down in the basement, Bud is trying to fix the air conditioning while Lonnie is slowly losing it. Can't be good for his little Lonnie brain when the voice returns over the speakers. It says they'll be getting the results they want, whether the employees play along or not, then lays out some ground rules. No more dismantling cameras and no more attempting to remove the head explosives. If you do either of those, you're gonna come down with an acute case of brain blow up itis. Then, the next directive. There are currently 76 of you left in the building. In two hours, if 30 of you are not dead, we will end 60 of your lives through our own methods. Begin. And we're off. Some people, like Wendell and this big dude Antonio, immediately start arming themselves with whatever they can find in the kitchen. Others, like this lady Agnes, just want to find a place to hide. Lonnie's really freaking out now, and when Bud tries to calm him down, he gets a reflexive wrench to the head. Oh shit, Lonnie, did you even mean to do that? Cause, uh, oh wow, yeah, that is one beaten skull, dude. It's a real memorable moment, as Bud struggles with some acute brain damage before slinking to the floor dead. A death all the more surprising due to Rooker's acting pedigree. Witness to this somewhat accidental murder was Danny, and when Lonnie sees her, he grabs her and starts swinging that wrench at her. She fights back and slams him back against the wall where there are some inconvenient pipes sticking out, one of which goes straight into the back of his head, killing him. Well, that's two. Maybe if 28 more people can die accidentally, everything will be okay? In the cafeteria, where most of the employees are, Barry says they have to consider all options at this point, and different ideologies begin to form, Mike being very much against even considering any murder. And as if Tony Goldwyn talking about killing people wasn't scary enough already, Vince lets slip that the COO is apparently ex-Special Forces. As everyone else goes off to make some rescue signs, some of the more utilitarianists guys stay behind and start talking about how their families need them at home. They take the blowtorch to that aforementioned armory in order to obtain the stash of guns kept there. Mike and Evan are against the plan, and when Wendell threatens them because he's such a big, strong man, Evan pulls out his handgun, showing tensions are getting real high. Mike talks him down from killing anyone, but also dismantles the blowtorch so there won't be a new slew of weapons in the mix. That was a stupid fucking move. Looks like Leandra agrees with Barry, chastising Mike for pissing those dudes off, and also for not considering the realistic possibility that they may need to actually kill someone. I get that this premise is a good way to explore how different people might approach a kill or be killed situation like this, but there's still something supremely off-putting about how acerbic Leandra gets with her boyfriend. Seriously, I'm just starting to think you're just stupid. Hey, hey, hey. Fuck you. She eventually calms down, but again, it's jarring to have serious character moments like this back to back with funny stuff like Marty and his crew deciding that the company must be drugging them through the drinking water. That's gonna get moldy! Especially considering the stuff that's about to happen, the tone just isn't well blended. A big group of people get to the roof and try hanging the rescue signs from it, only to be met with gunfire from the armed guards on the ground, and the voice saying that if they try it again, they'll have some exploded heads to clean up. In the stairwell on their way back down, Barry's crew attacks Mike and demands the keys from Evan. When he throws them down, Wendell stabs stabs him with a knife, because that dude is just one enormous asshole, in addition to being a pervert. Don't you call me pervert. <laughs> sounds like something a pervert would say. They leave Evan to bleed out to death on his own in the staircase. A real bummer, since that dude seemed pretty cool. Barry opens the gun safe and starts handing out some of the weapons to Wendell, Antonio, this dude Bradley, and Terry, who doesn't seem that scary. They corral the rest of the employees into the lobby, although when Bradley sees Danny hiding in the basement, he leaves her there. I guess that's one of those first day privileges, like having your boss buy your lunch for you. The other 72 employees all wind up together in the lobby, where Barry starts to sort them into groups. People with children under the age of 18 are put in one group, while everyone over the age of 60 is put in another. Another. Terry starts to have second thoughts about the whole thing, but Barry is steadfast that this is the way things have to be. This is the right thing. This is the only choice we have. He starts to choose the remaining victim, seemingly at random, but he ain't no RNG, so I don't think this is entirely fair. This dude Jonathan also recognizes the pseudo-randomness of it and starts making a fuss, leading to Wendell just executing him right there on the spot. Dr. Cox seemed a little too eager to get shooting there. Maybe JD should buckle down and quit daydreaming for his own personal safety. Barry's quote-unquote random selection includes both Peggy and Mike, so that sucks, but luckily Danny is still hiding out in the basement, so she's avoiding this whole situation, which is about to get real disturbing real fast. Barry has Antonio put on the radio, and a Spanish language cover of California Dreamin' starts playing, and this is where the tonal fractures of the movie are the most apparent, because the stylistic music scoring this scene makes it feel like the filmmakers are trying to make it more cool than disturbing. But rest assured, this shit is seriously disturbing, and if you're sensitive, you might not want to watch it, because after one last bit of encouragement from Wendell, Barry begins the executions. Last note, the count is gonna get messy here, so 
bear with me and please just trust me. I spent an entire day going over this and I'm fairly confident I got it right. Barry starts shooting people in the back of the head to kill them while Wendell counts up the bodies. We see a number of them happen on screen or just off screen, but I'm also counting a few gunshots that we hear as Danny runs through the basement terrified. My logic is that these people are lined up to die and Barry's probably not missing or wasting any bullets. And so during this initial execution scene, I hear or see 10 people get shot and that's how many go on the count. Meanwhile, Mike is trying to convince Terry to let him go. But despite his poopy pants crybaby face, Terry rejects Mike's pleas and gets ready to follow through. It's at that moment, Danny flips the circuit breaker downstairs, turning all the lights in the building off and starting a panic where everyone runs for their lives. During this sequence, I'm once again going off of audible gunshots, which is less realistic here since it's unlikely that every single bullet fired resulted in a death. But if you do this and count even the most faint gunshots going on in the background, the kill count lines up with what the voice says the next time it checks in on our characters. So with that in mind, during the sequence that's still scored by California Dreaming, which is uncomfortable, 13 unnamed people are killed. That's the number it has to be. Also during this sequence, Danny escapes into the elevator with Roberto, where they climb through the ceiling to get on top. When Antonio comes into the stairwell after Peggy, Mike jumps on his back and Peggy ends up stabbing him in the stomach with his own butcher knife, killing him. That's one of the wild bunch taken out, and another one falls when Bradley is distracted by the circuit breaker long enough for Vince to sneak up on him and get him down. Vince and a whole crowd of other employees then stomp and kick Bradley to death, getting real crunchy with it, until Razia begs them all to stop. Finally, the song ends, and so does the massacre. I got four more dead. Don't count. Just go. Get as many as you can. That's right, Terry. No need to count. Because the voice comes back on and says they're at 29 people killed, one short of their quota, and that they only have two minutes left to kill someone else before an additional 30 get off. So when Leandro gets the jump on Terry and gets him begging for mercy with the blade of a paper trimmer, you'd think it'd be an obvious kill. After all, this dude was just executing her co-workers a few minutes ago. But she can't bring herself to do it, so Terry is saved. Until the voice comes back on to give him a record deal. Or, sorry, to say that 31 additional employees will now be eliminated. And the first to go is, in fact, Terry. As some non-diegetic Tchaikovsky starts playing, we watch as dozens of employees fall victim to the messy, squishy explosives going off in their heads. Again, with the classical music playing over this whole thing, I'm not sure exactly what the filmmakers are going for, but I have a feeling it's more of a look how awesome and edgy this scene is, rather than a yo, this shit is fucked up type sentiment. And that upsets me, given the otherwise very grounded portrayal of these people as human beings. The kills include second-tier characters such as Leota and Peggy, whose death is real sad as she shares one last look of terror with Mike. Then it's finally over. It stopped. Well, okay, sorry. Now it's finally over. Keith makes 31 for the head explosions, and with the count that I've been doing, we're all squared up. There have been 64 employees killed, and only 16 remain. The survivors are left cowering in fear, or in the case of this dude Tyson, chilling in the freezer like his namesake Chicken Nuggets, when the voice comes back to explain the last phase of their game. In one hour, whoever has killed the most people will be allowed to live. It rattles off the current tally, which has Barry in the lead and Wendell in a near second, and Wendell's looking to shore his numbers up, so he takes a cleaver to the two people he finds in the bathroom, Mark and Agnes. We see Agnes die after a few other people, that's why their kills are number 65 and 69. I'm just grouping them together here because it's easier for the graphics. Head of HR Vince has one accredited kill, so he reluctantly starts to add more, starting with his own secretary, Razia, and continuing with this other unnamed employee who tries to run away. This one chick, Lorena, tries her own method at survival by exposing herself to Barry and telling him he can have her if he doesn't kill her. A real sad point of desperation, made even sadder by how much it doesn't work, since Barry tells her he can't waste a bullet and instead twists her head around in a CG effect not much better than that one in Freddy vs. Jason. Barry gets in the elevator that Danny and Roberto are on the roof of, and when he hears them up there, he starts to open fire. Danny's like, this is my floor, thanks. While Roberto is faced with the prospect of getting crushed by the ceiling. He tries to escape, but is instead crushed between the roof of the elevator and the ceiling of one of the floors, killing him and also stopping the elevator dead in his tracks, temporarily trapping Barry inside. Leandra, armed with a gun now, comes across Marty and Chet, who are removing the bombs from the heads of anyone who died with them intact. Their plan is to put them against the wall and blow a hole through to the outside. Side. An unlikely plan, but at least it's something. Leandro wants Mike in on it, so she gets on the intercom and asks him to come meet her on the first floor. On her way there, in the cafeteria, she finds Wendell dragging Tyson out of his freezer hiding place, cleaving him to death to get one more kill under his belt. Although maybe he was just taking that Tyson meat out to thaw for later use. But Leandro's not interested in Wendell's frozen dinner, so she shoots him, knocking him to the ground. She takes cover behind a table with Chet and Marty, but unfortunately, Wendell fires back with his gun, shooting Chet through the head, and as Leandro and Marty push the table towards him, Marty threw the throat. Sad to see both those characters go, but I'm happy they lasted as long as they did. Leandra pins Wendell down with the table, then stands over him with a fire axe. As Wendell cries in disbelief, she goes friggin' nuts on that dude's face, hacking it to a bloody pulp against the floor. And that's a wrap for our secondary antagonist, who goes out with a seriously gnarly smashed head. On his way to the first floor, Mike picks up this cafeteria lady named 
named Liesel, and they meet Leandra in the lobby where she shows him all the bombs Marty and Chet had collected. Mike pockets them for later use. Out of nowhere comes Vince with a Molotov cocktail. He throws it and it splashes onto Liesel, burning her to death and knocking the survivors down to the final five. Sorry, Liesel. At least you outlived the pervert. Don't you call me pervert. All right, I'll just call you smashed in face, dude. Is that better? Vince tosses more cocktails, sending Mike and Leandra into the stairwell, while Barry's coming down at them with his gun. He fires at them, but they get away, and when Vince goes to throw another cocktail, he gets a slug through the chest, courtesy of his COO. Vince goes down, another Belco employee dead. Take that, HR. Meanwhile, Danny's been being a total badass in the elevator shaft, monkey barring her way across the chasm, and eventually getting onto the roof of another elevator. She's been such a great player this whole game that it's frustrating as fuck when the script makes her decide to hop down into the elevator and senselessly take it down to the lobby. It makes no fucking sense, and of course results in her getting shot in the head by Barry when the doors open. God damn, that's the most annoying death in this movie. Danny was way smarter and more careful than that. Looks like Leandra ended up getting shot in the stairwell by Barry, so she and Mike make it to a quiet place where she can tell him she loves him and die. Real bummer for Mike, but an even bigger bummer for us. It's one of the last deaths of the movie and she just bleeds out like a Linderman. With Mike real pissed at Barry for murdering his girlfriend, the final showdown begins. Mike leaps out and starts beating Barry, who definitely has the upper hand as a special forces trained fighter. Their brawl eventually accidentally turns on a projector, giving the sequence the backdrop of a PowerPoint presentation. Somehow, random slouchy office guy Mike is able to get the best of special forces trained Barry, and he starts beating him in the face with a tape dispenser. The cover image of the Blu-ray is born as Mike lifts the tape dispenser high above his head and brings it down on Barry's skull over and over, pulverizing his face in yet another real gnarly broken head effect and killing him to end the Belko experiment. I mean the experiment itself. The movie's not over just yet. The walls around the building go down and armed guards come in to escort Mike out of the office building. They take him to the next door hangar that looks like the headquarters of Sphinx. Sphinx! And Mike finally meets the man behind the voice face to scarred face. The voice says they're part of an international organization studying human behavior and that they've learned a lot from these experiments. They try to give Mike a little questionnaire, but he cuts that shit short by saying he placed the explosives on the guards and the voice when they escorted him inside. He runs to the switchboard and starts flipping switches willy-nilly, killing the two armed guards with the explosives. Then he grabs a rifle and opens fire on the questionnaire guy and the cameraman when he tries to flee, killing a total of four altogether. The voice is left pleading for his life on the ground and tries to appeal to Mike's belief in life being sacred, but the time for that is over, and Mike opens fire straight into the voice's head, unloading an excessive amount of ammo into him and giving us the final kill of the film. Bloody and messed up beyond belief, Mike walks outside and drops his weapon to the ground. He stares up into the sky, probably wondering what sounds good for dinner, as the camera zooms out and reveals that he is still being monitored, along with a whole bunch of other people in similar situations. End stage one, commence stage two. Oh boy. Definitely an ending that sets up for a sequel, even though this one has enough kills for four or five movies on its own. Don't believe me? Let's get to the numbers. In a new kill count record, unlikely to be beaten anytime soon, 84 people were killed in the Belko experiment. Damn. From my research, that took way too long. It looks like there were 35 women and 49 men, but that could be off. I don't know for sure. With a runtime of 89 minutes, that comes out to a kill on average nearly every single minute. Good God. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Barry Norris, because it's a kill that actually utilizes an office supply, aka what the entire movie should have had instead of just a bunch of gun shooting and head exploding. Come on. Dolmache for lamest kill will actually be Danny, because I'm pissed at how unfair it was to her character. Danny was better than that, y'all. And that's it. The Belko experiment premiered in 2016 to mixed reviews and box office numbers, so who knows if we'll ever get that sequel. Speaking of sequels, though, we're back on that Leprechaun grind on Friday with part two. And until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching today's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Trisha Glasnovich and Jordan Shannon. My impression is that a lot of you like this movie a whole lot more than me. And that's totally okay. I express my opinions in these Kill Counts, but that doesn't make them the end-all, be-all appraisement of these movies. In fact, sometimes my opinion on movies is swayed by comments you leave. So if you love this movie, go ahead and leave a comment telling me why. All right, thanks, y'all. Be good people.